Hey everybody, happy Monday. A um, couple things. I am back in my casual clothes. We are back out inside because it is a monsoon with 60 mile per hour winds outside. So if we lose power, we will finish this video tomorrow. <laughs> Made some adjustments for sound, so hopefully everything is better for you. All right, now we are going to make a drop biscuit or as my mother-in-law would say, a lazy biscuit. We're not doing a layered biscuit. Mother-in-law sure was from the South. So they do like, you know, a cut biscuit, which is kind of layered and flaky, a drop biscuit, which is a little more crumbly, both delicious. Now, over the years, I have learned tons of different biscuit tricks, both from having uh, a mother-in-law from Dalton, Georgia, and just people that I've worked around. So we have two and a uh, half cups of all-purpose flour here. And I'm gonna put a teaspoon of salt. Um, and all these tricks are, you know, they make everything a little bit different, but all the methods work that I know, that I've learned. So I think that's what's kind of fun about it. Four teaspoons of baking powder. So drag this little ridge on here, that's what it's for. Level it, boom. Yeah. Wow, you learn something new every day. Yep, and when, with, with baking too, when you're putting in your flour, make sure when you do the cups, you level it off. I always do it with my chef knife, but you could do it with anything. If you want to put some cracked black pepper in here, you can. Optional. So what I'm going to, there's a basic biscuit method that we're going to use here. And then I have a bunch of add-ins, which aren't always like a traditional southern thing, but just add-in flavors because I like them with gravy. You could just go straight, bit like flour, baking powder, salt, um, butter, cream, or uh, buttermilk and you're good. Now <clears throat> we have some grated cheddar, we have diced jalapeno, you could even put the lime zest and there's there's different things that you could add to it to kind of custom it and make it your own. I have the oven, I, in the recipe I put the wrong temperature, but I have the oven at 450, 475. It's going to be smaller biscuits that bake quickly and get dark and golden on the outside so they're crunchy on the outside and crumbly um, on the inside. Now <clears throat> the two my two favorite things here that I've learned through working with amazing pastry chefs um, and being fortunate enough to work with Carla Hall um, for almost eight years is my pastry chefs and Carla used to always say, you have hot hands. And that means when I work with things with butter, it melts and then you never get that flaky crumbliness that you want to learn. So there's two tricks that work that could, if you have hot hands, and I think they make it easier too. You could put your butter in the freezer and then you could take a box grater and you could grate your butter in to your biscuit. And then when you mix it, it gets those little peas that you're looking for. And you could do this with any recipe that tells you to like work like a pie crust, work that butter in. You freeze it, you grate it. Now, this is another great trick that I learned, and I actually learned this one from Cook's Illustrated, and it seemed so, no way this is gonna work to me, and then it worked. You melt your butter, you let it cool, like almost come back to room temperature, which takes five or 10 minutes, and then you take your milk, your cream, or your buttercream that is really chilled, and you whisk this butter mix this butter into your buttermilk, which makes it start to bead up because it's cold, and then you throw that in. So both of these methods work beautifully. Now I am going to, I'm gonna put in the jalapeno. I'm gonna put in the cheese. Do we have any questions yet, Liv? Like people say, no, it's not a Southern biscuit, don't put that in there. <laughs> um. Kayla's wondering if there's anything baking powder can be replaced with. Uh, I've seen some ratios for baking powder for baking soda, but I don't think so, no. We're gonna put in our corn. Um, I just had, you could use frozen corn. Um, you could use, if you have canned corn, make sure it, all the liquid is off of it. You could use fresh corn that's off the cob that you blanch real quick. Just make sure that they're all cool going in. All right, now watch this. So we take the melted butter and we have our um, buttermilk cream situation here chilled. And as you're mixing this butter in, you see how it's clumping? See that, mm -hmm. Liv? Could you get in there? Yeah. 
it's forming in to those little beads or those little peas that you always see in recipes for biscuits. When you look at biscuit recipes, it says cut the butter into little peas of form. When you melt the butter, then you put it in this cold liquid. Um, you know, I think buttermilk's perfect. If you don't have buttermilk, um, heavy cream will work. And then you get this really great beaded situation. So you could use this trick or you can use the great butter trick. Um, anyhow, you're using essentially two and a quarter sticks of butter total there. And Bart is wondering if it has to be unsalted butter. I prefer unsalted butter. I feel that if you don't use unsalted butter, you lose control of the salt. Um, so that doesn't work. So I wouldn't recommend using salted butter. All right, now we're gonna pour in this liquid and mix it until it pulls away from the side of our bowl. We don't wanna over mix it because if we over mix it, we, we take all that cold butter, it starts to break down too much and then we don't get those nice crumbs and crusty biscuits. So you can see it's pulling aside. If it's too wet, you could always add a little bit more flour. It's better to be slightly too wet than too dry because it's hard to add liquid in. Kevin is wondering if there are any big no-no items to put in the biscuits. Um, yeah, you don't want to put a steak in here. <laughs> I mean, you could put some bacon in there if you want. You know, that works. Uh, I, you know, just uh, be cautious and don't put too many in or it's going to just turn into a rock. All right, you see how this is pulling apart from the side? So it's yeah. slightly sticking, but pulling away. That's the situation we're looking for. There's no more flour in the bowl. As you go through here, the flour is mixed evenly into our dough, but we're not overworking it to melt that butter. What else do we got for questions, Liv? Um, vacation pits. Interesting. They're wondering if there were any leftover pork chops yesterday. Oh, yes. Well, look. They're actually, I put a ham gravy. We didn't make ham yet because I thought I was going to make ham for Easter. Um, I couldn't find ham, so we made pork chops, and the leftover pork chops are going to go into our gravy. So, yes, we have leftovers. All right, now, next I have a baking sheet. I have it lined with a silpat. You can line it with butter, any way it works. And my pastry brush, and I have a quarter cup measure and a little bit of melted butter. I'm going to just butter the inside of my measure and we're going to scoop these out, level them off and drop them. Scoop level, drop. When they start to stick, just rebutter. And you could see how, I mean, this, you want, the, the key to anything I think you guys is you want to make them as easy as possible and not disrespect the history, you know, like the first time I made, when I first started dating Liz, she said, oh, my mom's from the South. So I did a dinner and I made biscuits and, and they, they, they weren't good. And she just was like, oh, I, I'm going to teach you how to do this. So, you know, whenever you're taking a shortcut, make sure the shortcut doesn't hurt the end result, so to speak. All right. These go in 475. We do one more tray. A lot of people are wondering how to make buttermilk. It's, it's too, you could look at the recipes online. You could take cream and essentially sour it um, with a little bit of um, lemon or vinegar. But, I mean, maybe they just can't find it in this time. It's one of those things I just buy. But you, you could make your own sour cream. You could make your own buttermilk. Just Google make buttermilk, make sour cream and it'll, they're, they're all there for you. Kathy's wondering if you could make the dough ahead of time and then freeze it for later. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I make it and I go, it comes together in seconds. Um, you know, some things freeze great, some things don't. This doesn't freeze great, you know? So I would, um, I'd make the dough as you need it. 
and again it comes together in minutes and then you could just bake away i have i've seen people do get to this part freeze it and bake it i don't love the results but i've seen people do it All right, these are going to go and i'll make the rest later any other questions Liv? um yes uh, there's a, been a couple people actually that asked the difference between a scone and a biscuit. Totally different beast. Um, a scone is heavy and dense and much more crumbly. A biscuit is more leavened and light, very buttery, very flaky. I, I gotta be honest, no offense to those who come from the scone parts of the world, I hate a scone. I'm not a I fan of like scone. I, I don't like them. Give me a biscuit. Give me a, a muffin. <laughs> give me a croissant. Give, I just think there are so many better options than that. So here we have yesterday's pork chops, leftovers. I'm going to dice these up. And since I didn't have ham, even though we did these on the grill, I wanted a little bit more of a kick of uh, smoke. So I put, I chopped up two pieces of bacon which I just have crisping in the pan um, right now. And we'll add this to that situation with a couple tablespoons of butter. Um, a couple people were wondering, could they use parchment paper for the biscuits? Parch parchment would work fantastic. Parchment would be a, 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 a great option um, in place of the Silpats. Silpats, if you guys haven't used Silpats, you know, there's something that you see in the restaurant industry all the time. Um, I would highly recommend getting them. They're not that expensive. They last forever. Like the ones that, ones that we have at the restaurant, we replace every, I'd say, 18 months or so. Um, at home, I've had these for six, seven years, you know, because we're not using them constantly. But things release beautifully on them. They're also great to put underneath a cutting board um, so your cutting board doesn't slide around when you're using it. So they have more than one use, and I highly recommend getting them. All right, so bacon is going. I put in uh, two ounces of butter, and there's a, a little bit of bacon fat in there. So two ounces of butter, two ounces of flour, thicken a quart of liquid. So we have our butter, our bacon, our onion. I'm gonna turn up the heat to medium. I'm gonna put in a small pinch of salt because the bacon has some salt already to it. I'm gonna let that start to break down. And then as soon as that starts to break down, I'm gonna add my pork and kind of warm that through. And then I'm gonna add my flour. Now in the gravy, there's spices that you could add in there if you want. Uh, sweet or smoked paprika would be nice. Cayenne would be nice. A bunch of black pepper would be nice. Um, some people even, let's put in a little bit of, let's put in a little bit of paprika just for fun. Um, some people like to put, a, after with their liquid, they like to put a shot of espresso in there, like a, a red eye gravy. You know, all those methods I like and I think are solid. Right. So now we our leftover pork goes in. This is obviously already cooked, but we're just gonna get a little bit of caramelization on there and release some of that fat into our other fat. So we have one big fat hot tub of happiness, which we like. Whole mess of cracked black pepper. A couple of people are wondering if you can remind them where to find these recipes. You could find these recipes on the Food Network Kitchen Facebook page. You could find them at Chef Simon with a Y um, on uh, Instagram or on my Facebook page. Now flour, two ounces again, two ounces of butter, two ounces of flour, quart of liquid. And mix the flour in. Little bit more. When you're mixing in the flour and you're looking down to the base of the pan, you see I just eyed it. You're looking for a wet sand consistency always with that. Um, so that's one of the important things there is wet sand is what you're looking for. You don't want it too wet, too dry. 
just right there. Now we're going to let that roux just brown a little bit with our bacon and our onions and our pork and then we'll start adding liquid. I'm using chicken stock and I'm using um, some cream, but you, or I'm actually using milk because I ran out of cream. I used all my cream and buttermilk and everything for our biscuits. Um, a couple questions I wanted to answer, Liv, that I've been seeing a lot of. Um, a lot of people are like, I'm buying a set of pans. What set of pans should I buy? I don't buy pans in sets. I, buy, I recommend buying pans in pieces. Get it a piece at a time as you need it to build a set that fits you. When you buy a set, you are letting them tell you what pans you need throughout the set. Buy one at a time. Get a Dutch oven that's cast enamel. Get a, um, a non-stick if you want a non-stick, but just for your eggs. Get a, a, a saucepan that could be, you know, hard anodized or copper or stainless. And then just build it for you and buy it a piece at a time. That way you can get better quality as you go and you're not getting boom swaggled into buying this set. Sets are, sets are silly, in my opinion. If you've already bought a set, don't worry about it. Add to your set. But, you know, there's a reason that all these pans companies sell sets. It's because it's beneficial to them, not you. Don't, don't let them fool you. All right. So our chicken stock went in, and you could see how quickly it takes on that roux and starts to thicken. Then we're going to add our next batch of liquid. You should add the liquid like a quarter at a time or a third at a time because if you add it all at once, your you know your gravy's going to get lumpy. And because we have the meats and stuff in here, this isn't like we could strain this gravy like you could a Thanksgiving gravy if you made it lumpy. So add it, stir. Get out all the lumps, let it thicken, then add the next batch. And so you kind of have to keep stirring that, right? Yeah, for the most part. Once you get it, all the liquid in and it's smooth, you could stop. Whatever reason to be, my glasses are bothering me, so I'm going to go not being able to see. I'll just pretend I could see what's happening in this pot lid. Oh, it looks good. It smells good. Does it smell good? Mm -hmm. I know it needs more salt, and I know it needs more pepper, just for, by feel. What else do we have for questions? A lot of people are asking about how often and how you sharpen your chef knife, which I know you go through a lot. Yep. So I sharpen my chef knife with a whetstone. You could look that up online for whetstone. There's a lot of them out there. It's the best way to sharpen a knife. and they even do classes online that you could see how to do it. I cook a lot between the restaurants and home and everything else. So my knives are, I sharpen my knives weekly. Um, a stone sharpens a knife, a steel hones a knife. So you could run your knife up and down that steel a billion times. It's never going to get it. It's never going to sharpen it. It's just going to hone it. Ooh, biscuits are looking good. It's just going to hone it. So don't think it's going to make it sharp. You, I use the steel every day and I use the stone once a week or every uh, 10 days. But you're probably cooking more than the Then more than the average chicken. person. Um, there's also at farmers markets now and hardwood store, hardware stores, once they open back up, there is, that's just a little bit of milk I put in there guys, there is um, always often a sharpener there that will sharpen your knives for you. You could drop them off and get them sharpened. Talk to people um, in your neighborhood. Maybe they have someone they really like and that would be another good option. There are electric sharpeners out there. I've heard some are really good. Um, I don't like recommending them though because they do grind down your knives quite a bit. If you have a good one or you're comfortable with it, perfect. Um, but I'm afraid to recommend them because someone's going to have a knife and then grind it down to nothing and go from like a chef knife to a boning knife. The other thing with a knife is, I'll save my stuff for stock, is 95% of what I do, I do with a chef knife. This is an 8 inch, get a size that's comfortable for you, a 6 inch, an 8 inch, a 10 inch, whatever you prefer. Um, and it's really the only knife you need. Much like the pans, don't buy a set. You don't need a set. You know, serrated knife's not a bad thing to have. Some people like a paring knife, so a paring knife is not a bad thing to have. But I look at some of these knife sets, there's like 20 knives in it. Like I looked at one once, it had a knife in there that said, tomato bagel knife. 
Like my chef knife can't cut either one of those things or a serrated knife can't cut either one of those things. It's funny. So I, I'd rather see you instead of spending X amount of dollars for this whole set that you're not going to use all of them, find one that you love, spend the extra money on that. And that's what you're going to do most of your work with anyhow. Let's see where the gravy is. <laughs> what that gravy is good, good. Wow, that's good gravy. We actually had a fan ask if the stock should be warm before you add it to this. It helps. It doesn't make it. If it's not warm, it's just going to take it a little bit longer to come up to temperature, obviously. Um, but it's not going to be end of the world one or the other. A lot of recipes say, oh, it's got to be warm. It doesn't have to be warm. It just makes it easier because if you're adding warm to warm, it gets comes to a simmer quicker. You can see there's no lumps in here. It's nice and creamy. We've got our pork. It's going to keep thickening up. Is it when it, every time it comes to a simmer, it absorbs the flour and it thickens. So in a per, you know in a perfect world between cooking out the roux and simmering your sauce, this is like almost like a cross between a velouté and a bechamel because it has milk and stock. Um, Thirty to forty-five minutes, you would cook this total to get all the flour cooked out. Um, so if if I wanted to make this a little bit of a longer class, we'd wait until this was completely done. It's still going to be delicious the other way, but the longer it cooks, it cooks out the taste of the flour a little bit, so it just it tastes a touch better. So if you could let that go 30 to 45 minutes between roux and simmer, you're in good shape. What else, lives? I am genuinely surprised how many people liked your happy dance right now. Oh, God. <laughs> Liv, you know, oh, God. I know you're like, it's questionable. I know you're like half my age and, and you know, the kids don't move like this anymore, but. T -t 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 oh my God. <laughs> stop. Make it stop. Yeah. Come on, 80s people. <laughs> Tell them. We knew the club scene. You know, these kids, oh. Olivia, she's good friends with Kyle, our son. They make fun of us all the time. We had clubs when we were growing up too, Liv. Oh we could my dance. God. We could dance. It takes two to make a thing go right. <laughs> oh my god. Um, a couple people are wondering, when you say a pinch of salt, how much does that mean? Oh, that's a good question. So when I say a pinch, I t typically mean um, like a, a three-fingered pinch. So three fingers and a thumb. That's a pinch. Okay. Um, you know, if I say a small pinch, like a small pinch would be two. Mm -hmm. And then like, a, you know a dash <laughs> if it was one finger like a lot of people when i'm teaching cooking class i'm like put in a pinch of salt and they're like Beep. that to me is a dash mm. um so so i've been doing all of my dishes wrong for my whole life you've been dashing i've been dashing well you know a lot of people too they think oh they're putting a lot of salt in that and what you have to remember is you know when you're watching you know like if me and Bobby or Alex or Jeffrey or whatever, we're doing Iron Chef. Everything that we're cooking is from scratch. So nothing's in a can, box, or bag. So there's no salt in those things preserving them. So salt brings out the flavor of food and it opens up your palate. So without it, you never get the full taste. So if you're typically though, when things are made from scratch, even though it might appear that you're putting in a bunch of salt, it probably still only has half as much salt is or less than the stuff that's in the can, the box, um, or the bag. Now, if you can't have salt in your diet at all, there's things that you could, um, like acidity, uh, vinegars, citrus, also open up your palate and bring out flavor. Horseradish actually does um, too. So there are things that you could use. I've heard people say, I can't think of the name of it, not Mrs. Dash or something like that, which is a salt um, alternative. I've never used that, but there are people that use it. But um, if you bump up the use of acidity and maybe horseradish or fresh herbs you could get big flavors out of food um without you know if you're trying to reduce your salt intake all right get, ooh, those are getting close and nothing yummy over here lives this isn't something that we're, i'm going to give a rest i'm going to just verbal it i had some extra greens i had some collards and kale and mustards and i just cooked them up with some bacon and onion because i thought they would be good with this whole situation so i crisped the bacon i added the onion I put in a couple splashes of hot sauce, the greens, and cooked them down. Just I wanted to use them up because they were they were past their prime. Um, so we have someone wondering if they were. Oh, where did it go? Oh no! Oh, there we go. 
Becky. She wanted to see if she could do the same gravy with a smoked ham, but would she still use chicken stock? Yeah, 100%. And the other thing that you could do, Becky, is if you're doing it with smoked ham, um, you could use that ham um, bone to make a stock too. You could even take a chicken stock, throw the ham bone in there, simmer it, and it'll flavor um, your chicken stock. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, you could use a veggie stock, you could use a beef stock, you could use a ham stock, you could use a chicken stock. All work. Um, you know, and same in here. You know, you could, if you had leftover ham yesterday, you could use ham. Pork chops, you could use pork chops. If you wanted to go straight bacon, straight bacon would work. If you just had um, ground sausage, ground sausage, you could make a sausage gravy, brown the sausage first. Or if you didn't want any meat in here at all, you could just make a gravy without the meat, just the onion, the roux, the spices, the milk, the cream, the pepper, the you know veggie stock in that case, and you'd be good. Or put some mushrooms in it, or you know, don't don't let. Look, you guys, we're in like day twenty nine. Ooh, tomorrow we're making my mom's uh, pot roast. My mom's mm. Italian pot roast. You know, yummy. Um, but don't let a recipe limit you. That's that's the most important thing you could learn from these classes we've been doing. People get tied up in a recipe and they're like, oh, I don't have corn, I can't make it. I don't have ham, I can't make it. You can still make it. Look, learn the techniques. That's why we're teaching you the techniques. And then apply the technique to what you're making. If it calls for ham and you don't have ham, but you have a pound of salami in your fridge, you could make a like a crispy salami gravy and it would be delicious. Optional, if you want, a couple dashes of hot sauce. If I like hot sauce. If you don't have hot sauce, could you use like those no. flakes? <laughs> oh yeah, you could say, use yeah. chili flakes. Yeah, chili if you don't have hot sauce, you could use chili flakes. Yes. Um, you could throw jalapeno in there or a hot pepper would be nice. All those things work. That's why you don't say no before hearing the full question, Michael. I know, Olivia, I know. Those are almost done. There are some, look, I made these just because I didn't want to wait too long. So here's some that I made today. I'm gonna cut it open. So you can see that middle, see it's nice and flaky. Brush with a little butter. This is a cool little butter brush. A little butter brush, right? And then I'll take some of And did gravy. you put the same things in these or did you cuz you had these, put in the cheese and These the, are the same. Okay. Yeah. These are the same. So, just because this is going to end up being mine and Liz and Liz's dinner tonight, I'll put a little bit of greens on here. Ooh, it's hot. Michelle's wondering what your opinion is about green hot sauce. Like it. I like all hot sauces. I mean, Liv, you could tell. Like, I, you know, I have like 20 hot sauces. Mm, it's a little I'm, insane. I'm a hot sauce fanatic. So there's our gravy. If you wanted to put an egg on here, this would, you know, this is kind of, a lot of people have been saying breakfast for dinner, breakfast for dinner, breakfast for dinner. I feel this is one of those things. This could be breakfast or dinner. You could go egg, no egg. Um, the choice is completely yours. Look at the steam. This looks hot. It's going to be hot. I'm going to, this is one of those burn the roof of your mouth dishes again, Mike. <laughs> All right. Yeah, this gets nice and flaky, buttery. How hot is it? Very hot. <laughs> <laughs> Get the smokiness from the bacon. Obviously, that nice porky flavor from the ham. Little heat from the hot sauce. Biscuit's great because it has texture on the outside, but it's super flaky and buttery in the middle. Whenever I make a biscuit, I go back to the first biscuit I made for Sherlock and the disappointment on her face. And then once she taught me every biscuit I've made, sense and the happiness on her face and I judge where I am in the world of the 
30 years ago disappointed look to the current happy look, this would be happy look sure little biscuit. So tomorrow, <laughs> gosh, I'm pretty happy right now. Um, tomorrow, you know what it is? I, I realize whenever I make a dish, like, you know, Liz's mom taught me how to make biscuits and greens. I do a lot of Pap's dishes. I do my mom's dishes. And they bring me back to that wonderful, like a place, like childhood, adulthood, whatever, but a place, like around their table. And that's, I think, one of the good things that's going to come out of this is we're, a lot of us are cooking every night again. We're getting back around the table. Um, and that's how I grew up. So I think it's going to be, I know like homeschooling is hard, working from home is hard, but if there's the good thing I think that's going to come out of this is back around the table with people that we really love. Um, even like yesterday, Liz and I were around the table and Olivia was here, but then we, um, uh, what do you call it? We Zoomed our parents and ate with them a little bit too, and it was kind of great. So that's it. I'm going to get a little emotional. I'm sorry. Food Network Kitchen Facebook page for the recipes. If you want more, you can go to the Food Network Kitchen app. There's thousands of things on there. Um, and my... Instagram and Facebook page at Chef Simon with a Y. I will be back at five o'clock tomorrow. And tomorrow I'm going to make my mom's Italian style pot roast. My sister is going to be unhappy that she is in Columbus and not with us. But Nick, I'll make it next time we're together as a family. I love you guys. See you tomorrow.